Um, thank you, Chair, and thanks everyone for um, being with us today. I think it's been one of the most revealing and, frankly, unnerving sessions that we've had. Um, the failure of the justice and penal system to recognise and respond to people with disabilities is quite shocking. Um, in some cases, it seems to amount to people being punished because they have an unidentified or unsupported disability, or even an identified one. Um, I think your insights and recommendations are invaluable in helping us prepare reports and hold authorities to account as well. Um, Article 12 of the UNCRPD aims to ensure people with disabilities can make their own decisions, and given that the Assisted Decision Making Amendment Act is being rushed through the door at the moment, I'm going to mainly focus my questions on that. Um, so first, I think, mainly for the Mental Health Commission. Um, a significant source of concern reflected in the Children's Committee during pre legislative scrutiny of the report um, was the lack of engagement with DPOs with disabled people's organisations in developing the decision support service draft codes of practice. Um, there was actually no engagement with DPOs for that. Um, could you clarify if there's governance arrangements in place to ensure that decision support services are meaningfully engaging with disabled people and the representative organisations in the performance of their functions, um, especially organisations led by people with intellectual disabilities, experience of mental health services and neurodivergent people and older people. Um, the Assisted Decision Making Amendment Act retains the use of substitute decision making. Um, but the general comment, I think is number one, of the UNCRPD took Article 12 to prohibit substitute decision making. Um, so when Ireland ratified the convention in 2018, the state en entered a declaration permitting the retention of substitute decision making. So I'm just curious to know what the Commission's position on substitute decision making is. Um, and then maybe questions for everybody, or, and if anybody else wants to come in on that as well, that would be great. The, but um, another area of concern is the exclusion of people involuntarily detained from assisted decision making um, from the bill. So the government's plan to leave changes in this area to um, the Mental Health Act. Um, I'm just wondering if you'd agree that this is unhelpful and stigmatising to other people um, with mental health difficulties in realising rights around will and preferences. Um, so should the government address these issues in the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act Amendment Bill now? Um, and finally, the Assisted Decision Making Bill is about recognising and valuing an individual's will and preference. So I'm wondering if you have suggestions or examples, perhaps from other countries, of how this can be achieved um, in carceral settings, be it imprisonment, um, or those invol involuntarily detained, um, and how do we take their capacity to make decisions seriously? Okay, will we start with uh, John? Yeah, I'd, I'd start, I'd, I mean, I've heard that comment before that there was no engagement with people with disabilities uh, in terms of the decision support service and the guidelines, and, and that's not correct. Um, so unless there's some technical term that I'm missing, uh, that somehow we haven't, but to even give that impression is just not correct. Uh, we've put a lot of work into um, engaging with stakeholders. We have a forum, we have a stakeholder forum every month where we ensure the voice of the person is heard. I think Anya, um, and I'm happy to send you the facts of the matter, um, Anya has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of organisations and people non stop. So the idea that somehow, now it may be that the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act. So the act itself, which we're not uh, accountable for bringing through, that's the department. There may be issues there, but in terms of the DSS, there isn't, because the reason that we want to, and if there is, uh, uh, genuinely, if there's some technical thing that we've missed, that we're not speaking to the right people, uh, I'd, I'd want to know, because the reason that we have taken on this uh, decision support is because we want to vindicate the rights of people you know, with a disability, and we want to vindicate people's human rights. So uh, there, there may be some confusion in, in what one group is saying, or informing you, uh, and what we're doing, and I'm happy to discuss that, but uh, quite genuinely, we have put the engagement at the, the centre of it, um, so, I mean, just, just to be... Which, which DPOs have you engaged with, then? Excuse me if I'm incorrect. Well, sure. Which uh, I mean, I can, I can get on you to send it on to you exactly, I mean, but, I mean, we, we've engaged with hundreds of organisations and thousands of people with disabilities. Like, so, I, I don't know, like, maybe you could tell us the ones we haven't engaged with, um, and I'll send that on to Anya, and, and we'll absolutely rectify it. 
Yeah. yeah, any of the ones that have come before this committee have said they weren't engaged with some of the draft codes of practice. So one of the biggest concerns with the assisted decision making capacity act bill codes of practice was that but should we for put example, the codes of practice tenant? out from the codes of practice were out for uh, public consultation from I think November to February. Um, three or four months, and so I, I mean, I'm very happy to. Yeah, like if if you if you have factual evidence that that's the case, please give it to me, and I will absolutely make sure that uh, those people are included. But we've seen hundreds and hundreds of groups and, and thousands of people, and we've had uh, our engagement got uh, more uh, an above average response, uh, like a significant response, and we we do want to hear from people. Like, I mean, why would we not want to hear from people? The whole point of the act is to help these people. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, one of the main concerns, I suppose, is those draft codes of practice um, make a provision for, for example, a bank teller to refuse somebody their money in a bank. So that goes just, it flies in the face of the, the whole purpose of the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act. And that was, they were the concerns that we heard at the committee from DPOs who said they weren't engaged with. Um, and, I mean, that would be assuming incapacity rather yep. than assuming capacity. So the codes of practice mm. from the DPOs we engaged with were extremely put out by that, understandably, and I think so was the committee. So well, I could, I could understand why people would be put out by that if that's what people perceived. Uh, and it's something that we would definitely like uh, to fix if, if, if we can get evidence that that would actually is what is occurring or would occur. I suppose just to give you a sense, um, it's, there's an assumed capacity in the Act, and one of the things, powers that we have in the Act is, is that uh, to monitor and, and enforce and regulate that people are using the Act in good faith. Because um, I did hear that, and I actually read it in the paper, and uh, it just, the idea that someone would go to a bank and a bank person would somehow say, sorry, I don't believe your capacity, so you're not getting an account. Um, I, I was part of HICOR where we brought in, we went into the disability people, centres for people with disability, and none of them had accounts, and the staff were running the accounts and using the money. And we heard similar things like that from the staff, and yet actually when we pushed it, thousands of individuals were given bank accounts, and this is before the Act. So I do think that, like quite genuinely, the Act may have some flaws, interpretive and analytical flaws and academic, you know, perceptual flaws, but most Acts do. But I, I mean, I'm more than welcome to um, address that uh, question to the director and give you a, a formal reply um, on it. But I would be very surprised if someone went to a bank and that happened with the powers we would have. <coughs> if they came to us, we would absolutely uh, go after that area to make sure that they were using the, the law properly. Um, and the other thing is working with the banks, and I know the banks get a lot of, um, have received a lot of flack, but they've actually engaged with this in terms of training and bringing people, um, bringing people up to uh, standards in terms of the Act. So I, I was, yeah, it's unfortunate. I wouldn't like that to be the case, and I would like to, I, hopefully we can get a meeting with the people who think that may be the case. Um, but genuinely, through all our consultation and talking to thousands of people, that never really came up until that one, one uh, till you mentioned it. And I have to say I'm surprised mentioned. that you're surprised yeah. that people are refusing money in the bank. This is a regular occurrence for older people, uh, for people with intellectual disabilities, physical disabilities. That's not unheard of at all. It's surprising for me that you're surprised to hear that. That's the whole purpose. That's why we need this You say it's a regular occurrence. Where, where's your evidence for that? Even people coming into my, people I know. Well, it does happen. Absolutely does. We've heard that as a committee. People being treated differently because they have <coughs> a disability is a reality. And to say that there was loads of time, loads of engagement, like even the department were upfront and honest with us as a committee about the fact that they had to rush through the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act because there's a case been taken against the state. So if the there department. wasn't adequate engagement, that's not true. We all know that. And they've okay. asked for... Can I just clarify, okay. uh, you said about the codes, not the Act. I clarified to you earlier the Act was something for the Department. I'm not standing over the Department. I'm saying in relation to the codes. You said specifically that we seem to... You're given the impression that we've excluded people with disabilities, which we haven't. We've, we've put all efforts in place to do that. So I just want to, you know, I'm just giving you our view. We're not the Department. We're not the Act. We're the Mental Health Commission. We had the codes to do, and the inspect, or sorry, the director had the codes to do. So I'm just giving you the alternative uh, view from our, our perspective. So, and I'm happy to give you the, I'm right to the committee with the facts, the amount of people with disabilities and organisations we engage with.
Yeah, we'd appreciate that. And to review the code's practice, yeah. perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, uh, seriously. Um, just on the decision support service, I suppose the only thing I would say is that we really need to think about the practicalities and the logistics of people in prison being able to access that once it's brought in, because obviously, um, you know, we've We've talked a lot about resourcing the Gardaí and how they're under-resourced. I would say the same for the Irish Prison Service. You know, um, prison officers are, are not trained in how to deal with mental health issues in, in the way that sometimes they need to be. Um, and it is an unfair pressure that is put on them. So I think that is something we need to really think about. Um, you know, the report that we mentioned earlier talks about, um, you know, the under-resourcing of interpretation for people um, who may be deaf or people being uh, isolated in their cells because the physical conditions in prison just uh, they, they, they can't cope with their disability and you know when there's overcrowding as well that's an issue so people should be in single cell occupancy as well but I suppose on your other point um, Deputy Heron it's just on the exclusion of people involuntary detained we um, along with our colleagues in mental health reform would have written to the Taoiseach on this very recently we think that this should be addressed now um, it will need to be addressed at some point, so why um, kick it down the road? Um, we think that, uh, that there, there is a huge issue there for the exclusion of people who are involuntarily detained, particularly around things like advanced healthcare directives. Um, so we would hope that that would be addressed before the Act is finalised, even if it is being pushed through at a, a very fast pace. Okay. Fiona? Um, uh, the, the only comment we have to make is, is, is in terms of um, uh, the work that we've done. We've engaged um, a lot with uh, not just disability organisations, but also self-advocacy groups. Um, uh, but unfortunately, because we haven't been able to roll out what we're trying to do, we don't think it's fair to, to take up their time without having the resources to... to um, to help them as well. Okay. So um, I think that's that's where we're at, really. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you. And um, now, um, Eileen. Uh